Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Vali Nasser, the Dean of uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And it's my great pleasure here to welcome everyone to the school for this event today. For over 70 years, Johns Hopkins SIS has served as a platform for policymakers and students to engage on crucial issues shaping world events. Today's event continues that tradition of dialogue by bringing leaders and practitioners in foreign policy making to share their expertise with our students, faculty, and the broader community. It is a great honor to welcome Dr. Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, to reflect on the legacy of one of the most important and prominent figures of American foreign policy, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski. Dr. Brzezinski, or Zbig, as his students and colleagues affectionately called him, is best known as a public intellectual and geostrategic thinker, and also for serving as the National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter. But at least for us, more importantly, he's also a member of the Johns Hopkins SIS community. Having served as a distinguished professor of American foreign policy and a Foreign Policy Institute senior fellow for many years. At the school, he hosted a bi-weekly seminar entitled Current Issues and an annual school-wide lecture that always sold out. Dr. Brzezinski's legacy represents the best in American global leadership and the primacy of strategic thinking and diplomatic initiative in resolving complex global issues. During my time here, he held two master classes on the state of the world for our students, which packed this hall full, and during which he mesmerized our students with a tour de force, without notes, and brimming with not only insights, but also a complex roadmap to navigate important global issues. He will always be remembered here at Johns Hopkins SIS as a unique intellect, a caring mentor, and a captivating lecturer who was dedicated to educating the next generation of leaders in world affairs. Today, the Johns Hopkins SIS family gathers to honor his legacy alongside several members of his immediate family. We are honored to have with us today members of his family, Aurora Brzezinski, Dr. Brzezinski's granddaughter, Ginny Brzezinski, Dr. Brzezinski's daughter-in-law, Emily Hoffer, Dr. Brzezinski's granddaughter, and Laura Erlacher, who was like a daughter to Dr. Brzezinski and has served as Mrs. Brzezinski's longtime assistant. Dr. Brzezinski's wife, Emily, son, Ian, and daughter, Mika, could not be with us today, but we thank them in their absence for sharing in our vision to honor his legacy. Dr. Brzezinski's son, Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, however, is with us here. And I'd like to point out that in Dr. Ambassador Brzezinski's case, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He was a foreign policy advisor to the presidential campaign of President Barack Obama, and later was appointed as ambassador to Sweden by President Obama. He also served in the Clinton administration's National Security Council at the White House. I would like now to turn the stage over to Ambassador Brzezinski, who will say a few words to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Nasser, Vali, Madam Secretary, Director McLaughlin, ladies and gentlemen. Our dad loved SICE. He loved teaching. He was a natural teacher. And there was no better teacher than chief, as he was lovingly called by his family, some of whom are here today. I can tell you the Brzezinski kids feel a special kinship with my dad's SICE students because family dinners at home were like seminars, hard seminars. We kids were grilled. I remember one dinner when I had to defend SALT II, and I was about nine years old. <laughs> but we learned so much. As a teacher, my dad was a consummate storyteller, and he was able to translate his big life into lessons that anyone could understand whether it was his role in normalization of relations with China, 
and agreeing to disagree being the way he found common ground with Deng Xiaoping. Or returning the Panama Canal to eliminate paternalism in our relationship with Latin America. He was involved in extraordinary events and his teaching would draw on those events in a fascinating way. I took a look at my dad's diaries to see what he was doing on exactly this day 40 years ago, on September 17th, 1978, right in the middle of the Carter administration. His memoirs, which Madeleine Albright helped shape, reveal that on this very day in 1978, my father, President Carter, Vice President Mondale, Secretary of State Vance, were huddled at Camp David with Israel's Prime Minister Menachem Begin and an Arab President Anwar Sadat of Egypt. That evening, exactly 40 years ago, my father recorded the following. After a long evening session with Begin, it is beginning to look good. We might get a compromise agreement today, though the burden of it will fall on Sadat's shoulders. It will be hard for him to justify it. Of course, that was the Camp David Accords, which laid the groundwork for an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, the first ever agreement between an Arab state and Israel, and the longest lasting peace agreement in the history of the Middle East. And I think that that's so incredible, because we're at a time when people can't see past their differences. The Camp David negotiations were the epitome of people doing exactly that, a Likud prime minister and an Arab president, my dad helped President Carter, convene them not over their differing interests, but over how to maximize their shared interests. And if my dad were here today, I think he would draw on the Camp David Accords for an important teachable moment for the present for all of us. In his big life, with a number of extraordinary moments, there were few who actually joined him from very early to the end. One of them was Madeleine Albright. My father respected, admired, and most of all trusted Secretary Albright. He had been her professor at Columbia, had brought her to the NSC staff, and they remained close throughout his life. Madeleine's impressive CV has been circulated, so I wanna say something more personal about her relationship with my father. She and he shared certain attributes, an important one of which was that they were both immigrants from Central Europe, cast on America's shores by World War II, and that experience shaped their worldview. By growing up and living elsewhere, by speaking foreign languages, they knew just a little bit more about the world, especially a part of the world that was the focal point of the Cold War. They also understood America. They felt it. They felt its dilemmas and challenges, and they knew what to do about it. My father as National Security Advisor and Madeleine Albright as Secretary of State. My dad loved that Madeleine Albright was an outspoken Secretary of State, that was very much needed at the moment. And my father would frequently say that President Clinton was a beneficiary of her appointment because of her background. Let me close by saying that when people think of Zbigniew Brzezinski, they think of many things. A strategist, a teacher, a great father. I don't think, I don't, I don't think many people think of the word feminist when they think of him. But the truth is, is that he was a real advancer of women. Not because of their gender, but because he thought of them as leaders, as strategists, and perfect for the moment and for the challenges of our time. I could put out the names of a number of leading women in Washington whom he advanced, but none reached the heights of Madeleine Albright. He also advanced my, uh, his wife, my mother, my sister, my wife, and urge them to think strategically and to achieve their dreams while maintaining the tough balance of family life. I'm so happy that my nine-year-old daughter, Aurora, is here today, along with other members of the Brzezinski family, to hear from Secretary Albright 
I think we, we, we will hear in her voice echoes of Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, it is now um, an honor and a privilege to hear about Dr. Brzezinski's integral role in guiding American foreign policy from one of his protégés and good friends, Dr. Madeleine Albright. Dr. Albright has had an illustrious career in American foreign policy herself. She serves at, as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations and was the first female U.S. Secretary of State appointed to that role in 1996 by President Clinton. Previously, she served on the National Security Council alongside Dr. Brzezinski, where she grew to know him as a friend and a mentor. In 2012, President Barack Obama awarded Secretary Albright with the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her efforts to bring peace to the Middle East and Africa, reduce the spread of nuclear weapons, and for her role as a longtime champion of democracy and human rights all over the world. Today, she is the chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategy firm in Washington, D.C. She's also a professor in the practice of diplomacy at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. I would like to now invite Dr. Albright to the stage to deliver remarks, which will be followed by a moderated conversation with Dr. Carla Freeman, the director of the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Thank you. Very, very much, uh, Dean Nasser Valley, for everything, and good afternoon to all of you. Ambassador Brzezinski, Mark, thank you for being here and for carrying on your family's tradition of public service and leadership, and it's wonderful to see so many members of the Brzezinski family. I'm delighted to be back at SAIS and pleased to see so many good friends and deeply honored. Uh, to have been asked to present this lecture in remembrance of Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who meant so much to me, to this institution, and to everyone in the room. While he had many affiliations during the course of his long career, I know that Zbig very much valued his connection to SAIS and to the Foreign Policy Institute. So thank you, Dean Nasser for, and Dr. Freeman, for organizing uh, this event and for carrying on FPI's essential mission and for your work to educate the next generation of leaders in world affairs. Spig very much enjoyed the opportunity to interact with uh, future leaders during his annual lectures, and I'm pleased to have a chance to do so today. The timing for this lecture is auspicious. Not only is today the 40th anniversary of the signing of the Camp David Accords, but the President of Poland is arriving in town and meeting with President Trump at the White House tomorrow. So there's a lot for us to discuss, and I will look forward a little later to um, your questions. Since I'm, I'm no longer in the government, I will actually be able to answer them. Uh, uh, but I would like to begin on a personal note. It is still hard for me to fathom that Zbigniew Brzezinski is no longer around to tell me when I've screwed up on something, or on some occasion to tell me what he thought I was doing was right. Because I said at his memorial service, he did more than anyone apart from my father to shape my view of the world and my understanding of foreign policy through a relationship that spanned six decades. It began when I was a student at Wellesley College in an era where I tell my own students occurred roughly halfway between the invention of the iPhone and the discovery of fire. Uh, <laughs> as a daughter of Czechoslovakia, I was following events across the Atlantic very closely, so I leapt at the opportunity to attend a visiting lecture by an expert on the region who was also an emigre from Central Europe. Dr. Brzezinski was only in his mid-30s, but he offered a penetrating analysis of Soviet behavior rooted in a deep understanding of history, strategy, and statecraft. It was obvious that this brilliant man was destined to play a leading role in U.S. foreign policy. 
He soon published a book called The Soviet Bloc, which became the definitive guide to understanding America's principal adversary. Uh, I have it in my briefcase, um, and I look through it frequently. When I moved from D.C. to New York and had to transfer from SICE to Columbia, I took a course from Dr. Brzezinski on, believe it or not, comparative communism, a concept that he talked about in 1963. He was a superb and demanding professor. He assigned us lengthy readings in Russian without questioning our ability to understand them. He was an intellectual tour de force. He didn't put up with blather, and he spoke in perfect syntax and clear paragraphs. And to this day, I remember uh, when he called on the class for somebody to give the first presentation, and everybody sat there. I did my normal woman guilt number uh, and was able, in fact, uh, to give a presentation on people's democracies. I remember it to the day. And then a final paper which compared how nationalism and communism had developed in Yugoslavia and Vietnam. I recall slipping the finished paper under his locked office door with a note asking him to send me my grade. Dread hit me the moment the note was out of sight, the same dread that would strike many of us in subsequent years. How had I spelled Brzezinski? Um, was it B-R-Z-E-Z -E -Z or, God forbid, B-R-E-Z? I still have the note, which was attached to my paper when I got it back. He had not flunked me. In fact, he gave me an A minus, and I had spelled his name correctly. <laughs> During my years at Columbia, Dr. Brzezinski and his wife, Emily, about to us known as Mushka, and I became very good friends. At one of their costume parties, I even dressed up as the rear end of a horse. But I was so deferential, I never dared to call him by his first name. And I thought to myself, if I actually get my PhD, that is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to call him as big. I finally got my degree in May 1976. But then, by then I had moved to Washington, so I had to go to New York to defend my dissertation. And because life is so peculiar, he was on the airplane when I came back, having defended it. So I approached his seat, summoned all my nerve, and blurted out, Heisbig, and waited for the explosion. <laughs> it didn't come. At last, Brzezinski and I went on a first name basis. At the age of 39, I was finally an adult. <laughs> a few months later, following the 1976 presidential election, I got a phone call. And he said, hi, Madeline, this is big. Perhaps you've heard that President-elect Carter has asked me to be his national security advisor. Of course I'd heard. Great news. And he said, will you help me find a place to live? And I said, geez, Big, I thought you were calling to offer me a job. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm calling to ask you to find me a place to live. <laughs> I did find him a temporary place, and then I helped him and Mushka find their home in McLean. And later, I even found them a horse. A real one, strawberry. Uh, in 1978, Zbig offered me a position on the National Security Council staff, and I decided to leave my job with another man of Polish descent, Senator Edmund Muskie. This prompted the senator to say that I was the only woman in the world to go from pole to pole. <laughs> Zbig was an outstanding professor, but he was truly a remarkable boss not only because of his ideas, but because of his conduct. We were not staff, we were colleagues. His door was open. He wanted feedback. He didn't yell because he didn't need to. We knew who was in charge. Our weekly staff meetings were like seminars. He said so long as there were no leaks, he would tell us about his meetings with the president. There were not, and he did. We discussed the issues at hand, ranging from the pros and cons of arms control to the breakthrough in relations with China, to Carter's bold effort to broker the Middle East peace, an accomplishment which is on all our minds today. He expected us all to contribute, whether it was in our expertise or not. We didn't have to stay in our lane. And I gained so many insights and learned so many lessons from him. But looking back, what I valued most about Zbig was what he taught me to think deeply about the nature and purpose of American leadership and to ask questions about how we could protect our vital interests while still being true to our basic values, 
about how we could use our power wisely, not only for the right purposes, but also to achieve the right results, about how we could win the battle of ideas against the enemies of freedom, and about how we could lead in a way that would encourage others to follow. I've been pondering all of these questions in preparing to reflect on his life and legacy today. But in getting ready to come to SICE, I've also been thinking about a speech I delivered here in January of the year 2000 when I was Secretary of State. The title of the speech was Sustaining Democracy in the 21st Century, and today I would like to revisit that theme in the context of the lessons I learned from SPIG and the challenges that we and our democratic allies face in a new and tumultuous era. Now, given Dr. Brzezinski's reputation as a grand strategist and as a realist, there are some who might think that a discussion of values in international relations is off-key. After all, most realists see little connection between the hard-headed pursuit of American interests and the fostering of democratic practices. But Brzezinski thought the dichotomy between so-called realists and idealists was a false one. He never put himself in either camp because he believed that a successful foreign policy had to include both. He would acknowledge that those engaged in statecraft must address the realities of power, but he also believed that power had to be driven by principle, and he made a deliberate choice to select both attributes, power and principle, for the title of his memoir. In emphasizing both interests and values, Brzezinski reflected his view that American foreign policy must be shaped not solely on the basis of what we are against, but also what we are for. And for him, America's interests dictated that we should be for a world in which freedom is defended, human dignity protected, and universal values upheld. This outlook had much to do with the cataclysmic events of Brzezinski's early life, which, as Mark said, I, we understood better than most because they so closely mirrored each other. For both of us, 1938 loomed large. It was in that year, 80 years ago this month, that the Munich Agreement was signed, forcing Czechoslovakia to accede to Hitler's demand to bite off and swallow a large chunk of its territory. A few months later, the Brzezinski family left Poland for Canada, where Zbigniew's father was taking on a new diplomatic assignment. He would never again live in his native land because the appeasement had only whetted Hitler's appetite. In September 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. The Brzezinski family spent the war in Montreal, where as an 11-year-old, Zbig read newspapers and listened to grim radio reports about the German occupation of his homeland. By that time, my family and I had fled to London, where my father worked for the Czechoslovak government in exile, and where we also watched in horror as much of Europe fell under fascism iron's boot. And then something happened to transform the course of history and our lives. America entered the war and deployed its armed forces across the Atlantic, turning the tide in a battle for the very soul of mankind. Those years proved to me to Zbig and to small-d Democrats everywhere how important U.S. leadership could be. The United States was not present in Munich, and terrible things happened. But when the Yankees entered the war, everything changed. America's post-war leaders agreed that because of our country's history, identity, and power, we had a responsibility to help others protect and preserve democracy worldwide. They also saw, from the heavy costs of war, that it was in our interest to do so. So when the Iron Curtain descended upon East and Central Europe, the United States did not fall back into isolationism of the 1930s. Instead, it organized NATO to contain the spread of totalitarianism, supported the European coal and steel community to strengthen Western Europe, and helped West Germany rebuild itself into a vibrant democracy. Brzezinski was too young to have been present at the creation of the post-war international order, but as a rising academic star, a preeminent Soviet expert, and an advisor to Democratic candidates and presidents, he was a key player in the debates that shaped the U.S. foreign policy in that era. Having closely observed what was happening in Poland and other Soviet satellites, Brzezinski had no illusions about the communist system. He felt 
that the United States had to be tough in its actions and policies. So we supported the containment doctrine and also the Vietnam War. But as the United States got bogged down in Southeast Asia, he saw how the conflict was fracturing our country, hurting America's image, constraining the exercise of US power, and undermining the post-war international order. The actions of the Nixon administration domestically and internationally exacerbated the pro pro these problems. The secret bombing of Cambodia, Nixon's support for their military coup in Chile, and Watergate all contributed to a sense that America had lost its way. Power had become untethered from principle. During this period, Brzezinski grew deeply concerned that America was becoming isolated and that the post-war foreign policy consensus was evaporating. He worked on building stronger relationships with democratic allies in Europe and Asia through his leadership of the Trilateral Commission. But he also felt that the best way to answer the Soviets' ideological challenge and rebuild domestic support for international engagement would be, and I quote, to commit the United States to a concept which most reflected America's very essence, unquote. And this is exactly what Brzezinski advised Jimmy Carter as a candidate and then as president to do when he recommended that human rights be emphasized as a core component of U.S. foreign policy. Carter was eager to embrace this shift and to project a morally uplifting image to the world. So he outlined a new approach in a series of speeches which Brzezinski shrewdly translated into policy from his perch as national security advisor. Although it wasn't always easy to balance these values with the ugly realities of world politics, the Carter administration did succeed in making respect for liberty and human rights a fundamental tenet of U.S. foreign policy. It declared America's opposition to apartheid, spoke out on behalf of political prisoners, condemned human rights abuses, and reduced or eliminated support to anti-communist dictators in Latin America. The results were imperfect, and there would be instances where a more flexible approach was required, whether in responding to the Iranian Revolution or in pursuing full normalization of relations with China. Brzezinski would fully acknowledge these tensions, but he was also proud that the Carter administration's foreign policy put human rights squarely on the global agenda, helped America regain some of the credibility it had lost during Vietnam, and gave hope to millions of people around the world that were living under dictatorship, including the brave dissidents in Poland and Czechoslovakia. It also set the course for U.S. policy through the end of the Cold War, because even though Ronald Reagan campaigned vigorously against Carter's foreign policy, he agreed that America's identification with democracy was vital to the pursuit of our interests. When the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union dissolved, it thus marked a moment of vindication for the strategy Brzezinski had helped to set in motion. I had by then gained a front row seat to the struggle for democracy. With Brzezinski's support, I traveled to Poland in the early 1980s to research a book on the media's role in the Solidarity Movement. I did actually learn Polish to do that. For two weeks, I interviewed journalists and editors and other pro-democracy troublemakers, including Lech Wałęsa and Bronisław Geremek. In the process, I became not only encouraged, but envious. My plan had been to write about solidarity, but in my heart, I just wanted to join solidarity. It would take 10 years of pressure and protest before freedom in Poland could triumph. And but by the end of the decade, the momentum had built and the forces of change could no longer be denied. In Hungary, liberty was reborn after 10 months. In East Germany, 10 weeks. In Czechoslovakia, 10 days. And in Romania, 10 hours. After decades of slumber, the forgotten parts of Europe had awakened. And when I returned to the government in the 1990s, I had a chance to make the most of that opportunity. Our goal was to bring nations together based on core principles of democracy and free enterprise, human rights, and the rule of law. To that end, we took bold strides towards the creation of a Europe whole and free. We worked to strengthen NATO by accepting new and broader responsibility and by adding new numbers. Among those who offered essential support for this idea was Zbigniew Brzezinski. 
One of my proudest moments came in the spring of 1999 when I was able to call him from the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri to tell him that Poland had just been formally admitted to the alliance. It was tempting during that miraculous time to believe that democracy was in command and that the world would continue to move toward a more cooperative international system. In the span of just a few decades, we'd seen nation after nation gain its freedom in Asia and Africa from colonialism, in Latin America from military dictators, in Central and Eastern Europe from communism, and in South Africa from apartheid. We witnessed and celebrated all this, but also saw warning signs that the democratic tide could recede. We recognized that in many countries, the arrival of electoral democracy had been accompanied by economic expectations that were unfulfilled. For example, in Russia in the 1990s were a time of economic chaos, shorter lifespans, and declining birth rates. By 2000, surveys showed that most Russians equated democracy with inequality and the unraveling of the social fabric. Around the globe, newly democratic countries were having trouble matching the visible and immediate promise of elections with tangible, widespread benefits for their people. And all this was on my mind when I spoke here at SICE early in the year 2000. In my remarks, I warned that if these anxieties were not addressed, public confidence in democracy would likely erode and support would grow for failed remedies from the past, including protectionism and authoritarianism. Regrettably, it now appears this warning was prescient. Because in the short history of this century, we have witnessed a multiplication of international divisions, a backlash against globalization, and a worldwide retreat from democratic values. In the wake of the global financial crisis, China's vision of economic gains unaccompanied by democratic norms has gained appeal, and Russia's active measures campaign has succeeded in deepening social divisions, sowing further doubts about democracy, and undermining confidence in Western institutions. It seems as if almost every month there's a new sham election extending the term of an autocrat as president or prime minister. Just this year, it has happened in Egypt and Venezuela, Cambodia and Azerbaijan, as well as Russia and Turkey. In Europe, extreme nationalist movements are storming the barricades, shifting the terms of debate, moving into legislatures and grabbing for themselves a larger slice of power. I've spent a lot of time in recent years thinking and writing about what went wrong, and the person whose perspective I especially valued was Bigniew Brzezinski. With his deep well of historical knowledge, he understood the resonance of nationalism in Central Europe and saw that the entire continent was wrestling with questions of identity, ethnic and religious pluralism, migration, and the consequences of modern technology. To most of these questions, he acknowledged that there was no easy answers, but he believed they should be addressed through free and open debate in accordance with the rule of law as democracy demands. And he thought that democratic governments in all sectors of Europe and on both sides of the Atlantic had a huge stake in working together on behalf of shared interests and ideals. But what concerned Brzezinski the most at the end of his life was to see the United States playing a different role than it had in the past, with a newly inaugurated president who scorned democracy and dismissed the idea of working cooperatively with Western allies. Brzezinski spent his final months urging the Trump administration to define its foreign policy objectives and principles. He wanted the president to deliver a speech outlining, and I quote, why America is important to the world, but also why the world needs America. But such a vision was not forthcoming, so just three weeks before his death, he issued a stark warning using the one instrument he thought might actually reach the president, a tweet. <laughs> Spig tweeted, and I quote, sophisticated U.S. leadership is the sine qua non of a stable world, over, world order. However, we lack the former while the latter is getting worse. This remains as true today as the day he wrote it, because instead of seeking to unify the democratic community, the message being broadcast from the White House is every country for itself. Instead of standing up for the values of a free society, President Trump has expressed admiration for Vladimir Putin, 
downplayed the threat posed by Russia and strengthened the hands of authoritarians, despots, and right-wing nationalists in Europe, who can now point to the U.S. President's own actions and rhetoric in justifying their crackdowns on journalists, NGOs, and political opponents. And instead of mobilizing international coalitions to take on the world's problems, this administration has led America into a lonely position on trade, climate change, and the Middle East peace. And all this would be troubling enough on its own, but where we're seeing are disturbing echoes. It recalls the narrow vision naysayers that flourished in America in the 1920s and 1930s, and it carries with it reminders of a more recent time, that period in the early 1970s when America was divided at home, growing isolated abroad, under the leadership of a president who tried to place himself above the rule of law. America is once again in danger of losing its way. And what history teaches us is that our country has the capacity to correct course. And what Zbigniew Brzezinski's life and legacy should remind us is that power must be guided by principle. What then must we do to recapture this big spirit in American foreign policy? We should begin by once again putting values at the center of our international agenda, working with other democracies to solve hard problems and standing firm against authoritarian adversaries. We should assemble a global coalition to push back against Russia's attempts to spread lies and undermine democracy, recognizing the threat it poses to our security and our way of life. We should restore vigor to the transatlantic partnership in all areas, security, democracy, and trade. We should support friends in Europe who are concerned about the rise of political extremism in countries such as Hungary and Poland, and by leaders such as Viktor Orban, who seek to weaken this rule of law, undermine minority rights, attack the free press, and discriminate against immigrants. Just last week, the European Parliament took a bold decision to defend Europe's democratic values from this illiberal assault. We should make clear not only in our rhetoric, but in our actions on which side we stand. But these are not the only areas where we should act according to our values. We should develop a real strategy for fostering progress towards peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula without showering praise on a ruthless dictator. We should continue to fight the scourge of terrorism, but recognize that military pressure needs to be part of a preventive strategy that combines diplomatic, economic, and democracy support to fragile states. We should admit to our mistake and recommit to the Paris Agreement on climate change before it's too late. We should seek a cooperative relationship with China, but not ignore the challenges posed by its rise nor shy away from criticizing its human rights record, including its practice of interning members of its Muslim minority, because when we act on our commitment to freedom, we separate ourselves from our com competitors and adversaries. Earlier this month, the Center for American Progress put out a report making the case for a values-based foreign policy. And I should note that the principal author was Kelly Magusum, who had taught at SAIS and earned her master's degree here. What this report recognizes, and what I have argued today, is that reviving America's strategic position in the world will require leaders who see our democratic values not as a burden we must bear, but as an essential identity we should proclaim. I'm keenly aware that um, for the leaders of today and tomorrow, the experiences that shape my worldview and that of Zbigniew Brzezinski may seem like ancient history. A generation whose worldview was shaped by World War II and the Cold War is passing from the stage, including not only Brzezinski, but ardent defenders of human rights and democratic values, such as Senator John McCain. We cannot prepare for the future by clinging to the past, but I pray that we do not have to endure another trauma on the scale of World War II to recognize the urgency of civic responsibility, international cooperation, and the rule of law. To avoid that fate, we need to learn from experience and recognize the threat posed when governments become hostile or indifferent to the ideals that defeated fascism and brought down the Berlin Wall. It has been more than a year since we said goodbye to Zbig, and I miss talking to him and arguing with him. But today's event and so many others 
uh, like it that have taken place help reassure me that his legacy will endure. Zbig always understood that he had an obligation to pass on his wisdom to new generations. And I was lucky enough to have benefited from his willingness to be a mentor, and I know that many in this audience as well have. It's incumbent on all of us to carry forward that tradition. And that is why I'm proud to chair the National Democratic Institute, which helps train young activists around the world to assemble the nuts and bolts of democracy. And that is why I make my students read his last book, Strategic Vision, and why I recently dusted off my copy of the Soviet bloc, which is more relevant than ever. And it is also why I always teach the lessons that we can draw from life. Aggressors must be resisted. Hate can never again be allowed to hide behind the mask of nationalist pride. And the siren song of isolationism must not again destruct America from its res uh, responsibilities in the world. Zbigniew Brzezinski learned too much in life to expect perfection, but he cared too much to settle for the world as it is. He was a realistic optimist who never thought of this country as a victim and never stopped believing in the power of American ideals. He understood that freedom is perhaps the clearest expression of national purpose ever adopted, and it is America's purpose. Like other profound human aspirations, it can never be fully achieved. It is not a possession, it is a pursuit. And if we are to fulfill the legacy of Zbigniew Brzezinski, it is the star by which American foreign policy must navigate in the years to come. So my thanks once again to SICE for this opportunity and to all of you for your kind attention here this afternoon. And I now do look forward to our discussion. Thank you. I uh, want to thank you so much, uh, Madam Secretary, for returning to SICE to speak today on this very special occasion <coughs> and for your remarks that not only recalled so poignantly your personal story with Dr. Brzezinski, but also so powerfully, I think, provoked our thinking, stimulated our thinking about American policy and world affairs, very much in the tradition of Dr. Brzezinski. Thank, thank you. you. Again, I'm Carla Freeman, and uh, I direct the Foreign Policy Institute, and it's my honor to be here to moderate our, our Q&A. I don't often get to sit uh, next to Madam Albright, <laughs> so uh, with your, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to ask the first two questions before opening the floor to all of you. I think we have about half an hour left in our formal program, so I think you'll all have a chance uh, for some discussion. Uh, my first question, um, relates to uh, uh, some points you highlighted in your remarks, the weight that Dr. Brzezinski assigned to both power and principle in foreign policy. Uh, and you yourself have made your own powerful case for a national foreign policy that makes principles integral uh, to it as a source of, you, I think you were paraphrasing or quoting Dr. Brzezinski as a source of realistic optimism. So my question is, uh, what international issue or set of issues do you think Dr. Brzezinski would prioritize as an area of focus, or perhaps even an area of opportunity uh, for US policy today? Well, there are a lot of areas that have gone off badly, and I think that he would have a hard time, as we all do, kind of setting priorities. I think that given his background in terms of Russia and China, um, he would agree that those are issues that we have to deal with. I think he would be the first one to say the problem with Russia is that it's being run by a KGB agent. Um, and uh, he has played a weak hand very well. And the kinds of things that he has done um, in Central and Eastern Europe to undermine the democracy and the uh, structures that we all look forward to after the end of, of the Cold War, that that is a problem. I think that Dr. Brzezinski was fascinated by China and was very proud uh, to be able to be the one that led President Carter to normalization, and he liked visiting there. And I think that he 
analyzed it from the perspective of a professor in many ways, but also in terms of what could be done to really um, have a relationship with even um, very early on was a rising power. And he clearly would be paying attention and trying to sort out what the um, uh, kind of, uh, what the one belt, one road means and how the Chinese are operating and what's going on there. So, and one of the things that I think he was really good at was both with Russia and China, was understanding how domestic policy influenced their foreign policy and understanding their history. I do think that he would, um, I've never kind of thought of him as a great environmentalist, but I do think that he understood the value of the climate change agreement. But I also think that what he would have focused on an awful lot is what is going on in our societies, why there is an appeal for um, the authoritarian aspect, and what happened in terms of the awakening of the people and the relationship of the working class to the elite and a lot of the kind of um, issues that are going on that are making things very complicated. But I think the thing that he would insist on was that nothing can happen if the United States is not involved um, and understood how it has to be involved um, and how the American public needs to understand, as I mentioned in my remarks, why it's in US interest to do it. By the way, um, I did spend a lot of time with him. And one of the things, um, I was the last Secretary of State of the 20th century and the first of the 21st. Uh, what happened was, I started saying that about six months after I was named, which was kind of uh, <laughs> presumptuous, uh, that President Clinton would keep me the whole time. He did, and so I am. But the bottom line is uh, that I think it was a fascinating time and kind of looking at the changes. and. Dr. Brzezinski and I used to talk about what had happened at the end of what was a monumentally important um, century in our lives and what was going to happen in the next one. Thank you. Uh, I also want to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about the mentor-mentee relationship you had with Dr. Brzezinski, but also ask you to maybe reflect on how uh, that your relationship with him has played into your own role as a mentor as you uh, yeah. rose professionally, developed professionally? Well, I think um, there was no question he was a very tough professor. Um, I think he was very demanding. And I think the fact that he demanded a lot of his students, and as I mentioned, just assumed that we would all rise to the occasion, I think did make us rise to the occasion. And so. I think his mentorship was expectation um, that you would actually accomplish something. And I think the same thing happened at the, uh, as boss of the National Security Council because he respected us and demanded things. And so, um, and, and I think did push us in order to think broadly. Um, I do think that um, I think about uh, whatever I do in mentorship but I think that um, I must admit that I think I may have a reputation of being a tough professor, but I do think that you try to bring out the best in your students. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that what was interesting was Dr. Brzezinski might not have agreed with everything that his students said, but if it was backed up, he was going to listen. And he respected a diversity of views. And I think that is a very important part of mentorship. Well, I want to open the floor to the audience now, but first let me just express my thanks to the whole Brzezinski family who's here. I didn't do that, and I really am so grateful, and we're thrilled that you're yeah. here. Uh, I want to ask, if, I want to invite uh, the named fellow, uh, the Madeline uh, Albright fellow, Megan Seibold, uh, yep. to ask the first question. Madam Secretary, thank you for coming here today. Yeah. Oh, sorry, <laughs> are we okay? Um, just thinking about our relationship with China now, um, given the deterioration in the US's commercial relationship with China, how do you think this could potentially impact the Trump administration's goals of denuclearization in North Korea? Yeah. So I have to pay honor to Wellesley uh, because Mrs. Brzezinski also went to Wellesley. Um, and there is an institute now in my name, and uh, what we do is train 
Women for Global Leadership. So it's a pleasure to see you here. Um, I think that uh, what I am very troubled by is that there doesn't seem to be a coherent strategy on China. What I find interesting in reading um, the uh, national security strategy as well as the defense strategy, there's no question that we see China as a major um, competitor of ours. Um, and I think that relationships, and this was true of the Soviet Union, you try to find areas where you can cooperate and where you compete. Um, I think that there was a beginning in, by the way, every presidential candidate attacks and bashes China um, and then changes his mind when he's president. So President Clinton talked about the butchers of Beijing um, and then managed to uh, bring China into the World Trade Organization and develop a functioning relationship. I think that this administration hasn't really figured out how to behave with China and there is kind of thinking that he could charm Xi Jinping, uh, but basically that personal relationship um, is uh, undermined by the tariff policy um, that has disturbed, but, uh, because one of the basis of our relationship has been the business community. They are the ones that have been the foremost defenders of policies with China. And so that is a problem, the incoherence of some of these parts. Um, I do think that I was, until recently, the highest level sitting official to have gone to North Korea. Um, at the end of the Clinton administration. There was a lot of preparation that went into that. Um, and the bottom line truly is, I was asked whether the Singapore summit was a win-win or a Kim-win. It was a Kim-win. Uh, and I think part of it does depend on countries such as China to have an influence on the North Koreans. And according to news that I read today, they are not exactly cooperating and helping um, in terms of the trade and the various things they're doing. So whether they're doing it because they're fed up with um, Trump and the tariffs or for internal reasons, they clearly are not fully on board with the policy. Let me take another uh, question. I want to ask uh, a student to, uh, rather than, yes, sir. Can you wait to... And could you give us your name, please? Hi, my name is Mikey Cohen. I'm actually a DC native, and I'm here for the MIEF program after serving a year in AmeriCorps in North Carolina. And thank you so much for coming, Madam yes. Secretary. It's an honor to have you here. Okay. And I wanted to ask your thoughts on the rise of authoritarian states in NATO. What do you think should be the course of action for NATO to deal with countries like Turkey and Hungary and Poland that are really going the way of Putin's authoritarianism? Like, do we kick them out or try to fix them? Because the whole point of NATO, I understand, is to kind of promote liberal values. So what do you do when a whole bunch of countries are opposing those values? Yeah. Um, first of all, I really do think that we have gone through a series of things in NATO. And um, during the 60th anniversary of NATO, I was actually asked um, it was a, there was a new Secretary General Rasmussen. There was a group of experts which were going to advise him on a new strategic concept for NATO, and it was going to be very different. A lot of out of area activities and et cetera. You know, was cyber um, a threat? An Article Five um, issue? Any number of different things. And then all of a sudden, there really was a switch in the kinds of things that were happening, given what was going on in the Middle East and also with Ukraine. So NATO has been fairly um, supple, I think, in a number of different ways. Um, and I think um, has, uh, is facing very different and new problems. I think the issue that, frankly, is the most complicated is the Turkish one. Because Turkey has been a very strong NATO ally from the beginning. It has um, played a huge role in terms of helping us with their forces in a number of different places. Um, and um, play a very uh, essential role geographically. I'm, I'm looking at Spig's granddaughter, who's about the same age as when I took my granddaughter to Turkey, and she summed up Turkey perfectly. She said, we spent the night in Europe and we had lunch in Asia. And that just about summarizes uh, in many different ways the role that Turkey plays. And I think that what's going on, given what they're doing with 
Syria and a number of things. I think it is a genuinely difficult question. I would not, first of all, there's no way, there's no setup in NATO to kick people out. Uh, but I do think that there needs to be some way of putting more pressure, especially if they're going to buy Russian arms. Um, and, and then there's the problem of Poland and Hungary, who were so eager to be a part of NATO. Uh, Poland now is going to have American forces there. Um, and so I think that there needs to be the part of NATO which focuses on uh, a value system to just keep pushing on it and work with the EU where that uh, fits uh, to make them remember that one of the things it's an alliance of democracy. So, but it's a very hard question, and I, I hope that the that there is much more uh, thought given to it than I'm able to kind of pull together, because I think it is. I thought about the Turkish one more and more because they really have played an essential role, and some pressure needs to be put on. So, thank you. you. Let me let me um, invite this. Possible student, but uh, I'm continuous learner. And that, Excellent. As everyone should be <laughs> yeah. in today's world of lifetime learning. Um, Madeline, this was just brilliant, and thank okay. you. Good to see you. Um, I should say to his family, I did the staffing of the National Security Cluster for Jimmy Carter, and Spig's name came up all the time. I collected five names, sent them down to planes, and he announced. I was there on, I sent them down on Thanksgiving night. He announced them on December 5th. There was just no question <laughs> that he would be on the list. My question for you is, how do we explain these? This came up to me on election night when I saw that Trump was winning. How do we explain these complex stories to what I'm going to call sixth graders? I mean, if you want to get to the general public so they have some understanding, academic reports they're not going to read. And I think it's terribly important. In fact, I've sort of decided academics, tenured faculty can write their articles for one another, but then they need to write one for the general public. Because when we have such a large portion of the public that doesn't begin to understand the things you're talking about, I think we're in trouble. Well, I think one of the hardest parts um, is to get people to have foreign policy not be so foreign. Um, I have uh, been an advisor to every losing Democratic presidential candidate, uh, <clears throat> but, um, and I have been a foreign policy advisor. And so in order to make myself important, I say there is a spectrum of domestic to foreign policy. Um, and I think that we have to explain more how foreign policy affects people's daily lives, um, which is in many ways easier to do now than other times because it, it's really true. Um, and we need to uh, explain, and, and I was uh, talking to somebody about this today, on trade issues, for instance. What, and and de if you go to X place, how is what's going on in trade affecting them very specifically? I have a new way I decided. Um, I was out at Starbucks, and Starbucks has this uh, custom where they have you, they do a tasting of some uh, coffee, and they have a little cup, and they give it to you, and you'd think it was fine wine, because they ask you to inhale and slurp. Um, <laughs> and then they tell you where the coffee came from. So when I was there, um, they, it was from the DROC, which is not exactly a great place, but they said, we make sure that there are not children picking the coffee beans, and that also there is some attention to the environment and water. Americans are inveterate coffee drinkers. The only place in America that grows coffee is Hawaii. We have to have a relationship with a variety of countries if we're going to want coffee, and we are going to have to put some conditions on them being there. It's just one story, but I think that what one has to do is try to make it apply to people more generally. The other part, it's not the sixth graders that are the problem. It's some people that have very different views um, about what is going on. I've just written a book. It has a very bland title. It's called Fascism, a Warning. Uh, no, but I, but I really think every book always quotes Robert Frost, or every speech does. And the quote that I like from him 
is the older I get, the younger are my teachers. And I have been very impressed with the young people that marched in Parkland and various things. And I think we need to pay more attention to some of the things that they're thinking while we teach civics and try to make foreign policy less foreign. Uh, maybe on this side of the room. Well, then I'll go way to the back. Thank you for a great presentation. Bill Clifford, President of the World Affairs Councils of America and SI Salam. Um, multilateralism has not fared well under this administration, and since you served as our permanent representative to the UN, could you comment about the UN, the WTO, and say the International Court of Justice, and how you and uh, Dr. Brzezinski may have differed, where you think the future lies? Well, I was known as multilateral Madeline. Uh, <laughs> and um, when I went to, uh, for my uh, confirmation hearing, I came up with this term of aggressive multilateralism. And um, people thought I'd lost my mind. It's kind of hard to talk about benign multilateralism. But I really believed um, that given that period, that what we needed to do was to work with others. Um, and President Clinton was the first one to use the term indispensable nation, but I used it so often that it became identified with me. And there is nothing about the word indispensable that says alone. It just means that we need to be engaged. Now, um, there, uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, to the point of making foreign policy less foreign, traveling around the United States and trying to explain what the UN did and why we needed to have partnerships. Um, and I did find people who were fully convinced that the UN had Black Hawk helicopters that were going to steal our lawn furniture, um, and that didn't like the UN because it was full of foreigners, which frankly couldn't be helped. And so, uh, <laughs> but the real problem is Americans don't like the word multilateralism. It has too many syllables, and it ends in an ism. Um, but it's just partnerships, and I think that they, that is where we have to kind of explain that we become stronger with partners, that we don't have to do everything by ourselves, and not have this thing that's going on in terms of victimization, um, and that uh, having some kind of a system where with people, with countries that have similar views, we can make a difference on it. I think that um, Dr. Brzezinski, I think, understood, obviously, the aspect of partnership. Um, having developed a lot of them, uh, I think that um, the question is, what has happened now um, is that there is no faith in any institutions. Um, and the system is very, um, I think, divided as to where the decision-making process takes place. I did love the UN, uh, but it needs organizations and people at age 70 need a little refurbishing. Um, and so they, they need some kind of uh, better attention. There's a very good Secretary General now who has come out for a reform movement. I think what will be interesting is the um, week of General Assembly and all of that is about to begin. It'll be interesting to see what kind of a speech President Trump gives. Um, he was going to have a, a Security Council meeting to talk about Iran. Um, he was persuaded that that was slightly difficult to do. So. He is going to talk about nuclear nonproliferation, I've been told. Um, but I think basically what is important is to understand that there need to be fixes to the international system in some way to make it more functional. So um, again, to the students, um, don't ever do this. I'm about to use a, a plagiarized line, um, which I picked up in Silicon Valley, which is um, what the power of technology is in our lives at the moment. Um, and it's obviously a very positive aspect in so many ways, but also negative because it disassociates people's voices and the difficulties of doing democracy. But the line I'm stealing is people are talking to their governments on 21st century technology. The governments listen to them on 20th century technology and provide 19th century responses. And mm -hmm. so there is no faith in institutions, whether they're the national ones or the regional or the international ones, and it's up to uh, many of us to try to refurbish them. What's the source of that quote? Some, somebody in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it's a great quote, don't it you? And it really does summarize yeah. a lot of things, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, question on this side. Um, gentleman, there, gray shirt. And again, if you would please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Christian. Um, thank you for everything. I'm from the Netherlands. And in your sp very inspirational speech, you emphasized freedom a lot. And I was wondering whether you believe that it was freedom the, that is the democratic value that is being eroded in the United States and or in Europe, or are there more other democratic values that are being eroded, and if so, which ones? Well, freedom definitely is, but other values that are being eroded, I think, are a respect for the rule of law. Um, I think also an understanding of what institutional structures are required for democratic societies. I think another one that is being eroded is respect for the power of the press, uh, which really is the kind of guarantor that the public in various countries understands what's going on. I think one of the issues that truly is a problem is how everybody gets their information through kind of an echo chamber. Um, but I really do think that what is being eroded are the rules that sustain freedom. Um, and then the very important part, um, and, um, and I talk about this a little bit in my book in the following way, which is that uh, one of the issues um, is how people are able to make decisions. And one of the things that happens is authoritarian <laughs> leaders, whether we're talking about Orban or Erdogan, is that they identify themselves with a tribal nationalist group um, at the expense of a minority. Um, and so uh, what democracy is about is majority rule and minority rights. And I think people need to pay attention. I think one of the things that does happen um, is that there are steps that are taken to undermine all those things that I uh, talked about. The best quote in my book comes from Mussolini, who actually, by the way, he said, drain the swamp in Italian. Um, and, but what he said was that if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, nobody notices. So there's a lot of feather plucking going on now. Those are two words that are hard to say quickly together. Uh, but I think we have to watch uh, what the steps are that undermine the various uh, aspects of it. Um, young man back there in the black shirt. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It's been uh, thoroughly interesting. My name's Piotr. I'm half English and Russian. And um, I've got two sub, hopefully simple questions. Uh, one relates partially to that. Um, and I was just curious, based on your, your relationship and experiences that you had with um, Brzezinski when he was learning and, and educating others about Russian and totalitarian and all that sort of thing, how much that might have helped understand uh, the, the entity and maybe bridge the gap between the two over time and help, help, help to aid the... Uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and whether or not we can take lessons from that and maybe reapply them in the future to try and thaw the relationship a little bit. And then the, the, the second question I have relates to you've increasingly got organizations that are beginning to develop in Southeast Asia and elsewhere um, that are potentially going to compete with the established United Nations and whether or not you think that we could have almost a, a two-tiered international framework of uh, law and each everything else. Thank you. I think uh, to answer the first question first is that basically what Brzezinski did in uh, writing the Soviet bloc was understanding uh, first what the societies were in Central and Eastern Europe um, in terms of uh, what was their historical background, what were the forces within those countries, um, and not seeing them as just kind of victims of salami tactics, that, that there was an understanding of the society. And then he also understood what the tools were that the Soviet Union was using to systematically uh, kind of bring these countries under their um, auspices, some of them due to agreements made during World War II, but some of them were the, the tactics that they used, um, which frankly are not dissimilar to some of the things that are being used now in terms of undermining the democratic, uh, whether they were coalition governments and picking one group of the coalition to um, kind of be uh, really treasonous to the other parts. Interestingly enough, Czechoslovakia, 
was going to be the one country where communism won by election. Uh, and they had won their first election in 1946, and they were about to lose the one in 48, which is why the coup happened. But I do think that what Brzezinski understood was what were the motivating factors in society. I think one of the things that we have not paid enough attention to was what really did happen in the Central and Eastern European countries that has led them all to be somewhat um, really uh, potentially persuaded by something called illiberal democracy uh, that Orban has, which is majority rule and no minority rights, and then to hate immigrants. But, but I do think that um, if we had a chance to talk about it, I think we would talk about the societal aspects and why uh, bringing uh, and supporting democracy in Central and Eastern Europe um, didn't really work. Uh, so the second question. Right. So I do think the following thing is happening, is because there are real questions about how the UN operates, um, and because the Chinese are organized at the moment with their one belt, one road. By the way, I think they must be getting very fat, because the belt is getting larger and larger. Um, and they are using some of the tools they have um, in terms of developing um, various aspects in terms of supporting the economies in a number of countries and forgetting about uh, what we might do is to think about freedom or democracy in a number of different ways. I think they are creating a system and there also are a number of now Russian, Chinese, various subgroups, uh, a new form of multilateral uh, diplomacy where they are using it. Um, and where the United States, because we have decided that we don't need the rest of the world, are frankly not involved in creating some of these. And so I think it is, I, I hope that there don't become competing systems, but there clearly are. We are not good. By being so isolationist at the moment, um, uh, we are not being part of this. Um, and I think that I've just spent a lot of time in Europe and I think that people believe if there's going to be six years of this kind of government, that there will be different structures that um, come into existence and the United States will be isolated. So I think that the, what is going on functionally is very important to look at. Yeah. Maybe one last question in the, in the back over there. Carla, thank you very much. Edward Joseph from here at SAIS. Secretary Albright, you played a singular role in standing up to aggression in the Balkans in the 1990s, both in mobilizing support for the interventions in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo, and the effort to stabilize and bring democracy to those countries in the region. So I'm wondering if you could comment after that singular leadership and investment on the situation now in particular, the Russian role in the region and the current interest in Europe and here in Washington in having Kosovo and Serbia swap territory in order to end their standoff. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, um, who would have thought, and my life has really been rather peculiar in terms of accidents. My father was the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia uh, right after World War II. The little girl in the national costume that gave flowers at the airport, that's what I did for a living. Uh, and I actually understand uh, Serbian and Croatian. Um, and the fact that it was an issue that I had to deal with, first at the UN and then as Secretary of State, was really quite a stunning accident of history. Um, and I do think that I believe that we did the right thing in terms of stopping ethnic cleansing in the, in the area. Um, but I think the following thing happened. Americans are the most generous people in the world with the shortest attention span. Um, and these things take a lot of time. And I think that we did not really recognize how much care and feeding and all the things had to take place. And the Russians had felt, that, I mean, we did try. They were part of the contact group. We did try to work with them through everything. But I think that they really 
had decided um, that they wanted to put their weight somewhere else and would like to see um, Serbian nationalism uh, regenerated in a number of different ways um, and to show that they are, they are a dominant power um, in the region, as far as I uh, can see. Um, and they want to show that. I think that um, what is, uh, I thought of it, I think the hard part here is to what extent the United States gets involved in trying to get them to do one thing or another. Um, I happen to think that uh, there already are some discussions between Vucic and, and Hashim Thachi on some of this. There was a meeting that was scheduled last week that then was canceled. Um, and there's some ideas about some additional part rather than just trading um, those, those pieces. Uh, and um, I happen to think uh, for now we should leave it alone um, and let them try to sort out why. I think one thing that does bother me uh, is that all of a sudden we would get into the business of supporting trading pieces of territory. Um, that is part of the legacy of Ukraine and various aspects, and that there must be, I don't happen to believe in homogeneous uh, uh, states. I think I believe in multi-ethnic states, and so I think that we have to be very careful to intrude in that. By the way, I have to say that often people ask me what I'm proudest of as Secretary of State, and it is Kosovo. It didn't start very well um, uh, because uh, the weather was bad and um, there, the Serbs put out a bunch of decoys, and then I came into my office, and all of a sudden my exec says, sit down. I said, what's the matter with you? And he said, just sit down. Um, we have just bombed the Chinese embassy by mistake, which in fact created a lot of uh, issues there. The war went generally badly, um, and uh, then when we won, other people took credit for it. But the bottom line is that I'm very proud of the fact that there are a lot of little girls in Kosovo whose first name is Madeline, and they actually <laughs> like me there. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let me invite all of you to continue the conversation uh, reception in the Zeiss Cafe. Uh, but if I could ask you to just stay put for a moment while we uh, invite uh, Madeline Albright to step off the stage, I'd be very grateful. And now I hope you'll join me in thanking her for making this yeah. a very yeah. special yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. What an honor. I would like to thank you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have to say, uh, that I um, was deeply honored to be asked to pay respect to the man that taught me so much, Spignev Brzezinski, in a place that I feel so strongly about, Sice. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.